Hello, my name is A.J. Goldsby. I'm a life master from Pensacola, Florida, and I'm coming to you today to present a chess game to you. It's uh, between Bobby Fischer and a player named Schweber. Just to give you a little background on this game, um, this game was played in 1970 at the International Tournament at Buenos Aires. Um, it's been featured several times on the Chess Games website. That's www.chessgames.com. And um, it's been, I believe, the game of the day a couple of times. And also it's been, uh, I know, the PO problem of the day at least once. And I started working on it many, many years ago and never finished it. And basically the impetus to finish this game came from, you know, this game being featured on the Chess Games website. Another interesting thing, too, is that um, a lot has been written about this game. Um, British Chess Magazine did a series of articles on this game. This game was featured in the, the book, um, The Games of Robert J. Fisher, which was edited by Wade and O'Connell. And it also had many contributors, such as Leonard Barden, Arthur Bisgeier, Les, Blatz, Les Blackstock, Harry Golumbek or Golumbek, and Paul Kiers. Those are the ones that are just named on the cover. If you look inside and in the back, you'll find there's another list of people, and it's much, much longer. But anyway, um, and also, too, this game was annotated by Petar Trifunovic, or Trifunovic. Uh, he's a former Yugoslavian, uh, well, you know, from the former republic called Yugoslavia. Um, um, and, uh, and this game was featured in the informant in volume 10, game number 250. But let's just go ahead and get on with the game. A lot of it has been written about this game, and I'm just going to say this, that I think a lot of the stuff that has been written about this game is just dead wrong. And that's not because I'm so great or any kind of brag on me. First of all, you have to understand that most of the annotations on this game are, you know, were written at the time this game was played, 1970. That's over 40 years ago. And, of course, uh, uh, back then, chess engines didn't even exist. So that's number one. And number two, I'm not sure if too many players have uh, or too many people have really devoted the kind of time to investigating this game that I have. And again, I think a lot of the, the ability to determine um, what's right and what's wrong about this game is based on the chess engines and the advances that have been made since 1970, and also, too, the advancement in theory. Of course, the theory of this line has really advanced in the last 50 years. So, you know, a lot of those improvements are not due, due to me alone. I mean, they're primarily due to you know, the technology, the improvement in theory, and our general understanding of chess. But anyway, this game was played between Robert James Fisher, he's commonly referred to as Bobby Fisher, and another player by the name of Samuel Schweber. And it was played at the International Tournament in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in 1970. It was played in round four. The game starts off as a French. Bobby would always open with his beloved king pawn most of the time, and uh, black countered with the French defense. E4, E6 d4, d5, knight c3, bishop b4. This is uh, the pin on the uh, knight on c3, uh, basically is a threat to double the pawns, and this is the winner. Now, as far as I know, Bobby Fischer never played the move placing his knight on d2. As far as I've been able to determine, uh, Fischer never played knight d2. That was a favorite of a player, say, like Karpov. Karpov played th three knight d2, which is known as the Tarash or Tarash variation a lot. But anyway, this is bishop b4, and, and you know, Bobby Fischer almost always, as far as I know, played knight c3. And this results in the, in the system known as the Winnower. And the Winnower system is an extremely complex variant of the French defense, and it was really fashioned into a playable system by one of the reader, leaders of the hypermodern revolution. Of course, that would be Aaron Nimzovich. Um, a lot of people say Nimzovich. I think today it's more correctly understood as Keane did long ago. Raymond Keane wrote probably the seminal book on, on Nimzovich that has been done in modern times, and uh, he was able to determine that probably, we've been misspelling his name, that uh, uh, probably his name should be spelled a little bit differently. The N-I-M-Z-O-V-I-C-H is probably a little bit oversimplified. Um, but anyway, going on to the game, the most common response after Black plays Bishop to B4 is, of course, to play E5. And this sets up a very long pawn chain. Pawn chain does a lot of things. Of course, e5 closes the center. And this is by far considered to be the best move in the system. And basically, it's shutting down the center. It's making impossible for black to put a knight on f6. White's locking the uh, pawns. He's gaining space on the king side. And it, generally, that'll translate into the fact that white will have a 
definite kingside attack should black decide to castle kingside. Uh, the move e5 sets up a pawn chain. In other words, it's gaining space and makes it very difficult for black to find you know, a way of gaining his own share of space. And this is really what he's got to do if he's going to gain complete equality. Uh, by fixing pawns on e5 and f6, in other words, having by having this pawn chain here and having these pawns fixed here, it virtually guarantees that Black's LSB, his light squared bishop or queen bishop, is going to be a permanent prisoner in the, in the pawn structure. And um, also too, uh, you know, it's it's just a, uh, of course, after a further a3, bishop takes knight, pawn takes bishop. You know, White by establishing this long set of pawn chains on the dark squares and also forcing Black to liquidate his DSB, his dark squared bishop, then we, you know, White is really putting a, a death grip on the dark squares, and this will probably be true for maybe, maybe the rest of the game. An alternative here, rather than e5, backing up here, an alternative to e5 is possibly knight g2. And this is a dangerous type of uh, anti winner gambit. Alakine himself played it. Uh, in fact, if you'll search the database, it's a game between Alakine and Nimzovich, and I have annotated that game, and it is available you know, on the internet. You can probably find that with just about any search engine. And of course, after e5, that's the game that move that was actually played in the game here. And after e5, you can see that white has a tremendous amount of space, and he has many more open lines. You can see all the key squares that are being hit, queen g4, queen, queen g7. I mean, it's just it's just almost a limitless number of possibilities there. So anyway, going back through the game, we're just going to quickly run through the opening moves because I'm talking a lot. e4, e6, d4, d5, knight c3, bishop b4. White plays e5 there, and now black plays the standard move, which is c5. That's correct. Breaking in the center, a3, bishop takes c3 check, b takes c3. Now, the most common move here by far, according to the books, the one that's the books considered to be correct in, according to theory, is 97. I used to think that black's next move was a mistake, a minor mistake, but an error nonetheless, and it's he plays queen c7. Okay, The idea of queen c7 is basically it's just a very... A fluid move and a, and a very um, uh, keeps a lot of black's options open. Uh, the main line, according to theory, is 97. I used to think that you could punish black when he varied from set opening, but I now, now no longer believe that's possible. I think that both queen c7 and 97 are equally good, and more than likely, if white is interested in playing one specific line, neither move is going to discourage white from either playing the poison pawn or from playing the. Uh, the uh, a4 in fact queen c7 will actually give uh black an extra uh possibility here in this position white now decides to play queen g4 black could play f5 and hit the hit the queen and uh you know the black does not have to play the poison pawn if he chooses not to do so and we're just quickly here though we're going to run through i just want to show you what theory is because the main line is 97 and now we're going to look at something called the french poison pawn and, uh, of course, white could play the main lines with the positional lines with knight f3 or a4. But let's just quickly look at this line because this is called uh, the main line by a lot of books. And it's what is commonly known as the French poison pawn. Queen g4 hitting the, of course, the pawn on g7 is about to get spanked. Queen c7, queen takes g7, rook g8. This is known as the French poison pawn again. Queen takes h7, c takes d4. Now there's the threat, of course, if he simply recaptures, black goes queen c3 check and it's forking the king and the rook the king is attacked and the rook will be attacked that explains white's next move why he plays knight e2 and now black plays knight bc6 f4 d takes c3 queen d3 and this is the main line of of this uh uh whole variant here this whole system or subsystem really of the winner if you will again it's called the french poison pawn of course there's many many sidelines and variants and a good example that take note of the current position after 12 queen d3, and I found a good, fairly recent uh, example of this would be the game between Karjakin and Kamsky, five Grand Prix in Nalchik, Russia, 2009. White won a very nice game, uh, you know, 32 moves. Of course, Kamsky and, and Karjakin are 2,700 players even today, so, I mean, this is a fairly impressive game, and it shows that White's position probably is better. White did win that game. Now, back in the uh, not early 1970s, there was a book published. I own a copy of the book. It was called How to Open a Chess Game. It was published by RHM Publishing, I believe circa 73 or 74. But anyway, uh, Portish in that book uh, recommended that Black play a fairly odd continuation. The idea is queen a5, bishop d2, queen a4. 
And the idea is to use the black queen to blockade the position. You don't see this. I don't see super GMs playing this line at all. But, um, and I haven't seen very many GM examples in the database at all. I did find one example between Ivan Chuck and Sako. Um, and it's from the 16th European men's champion, Heraklion Greece, or Heraklion Greece. And it's from 2007. And White won a tough struggle there after, you know, 63 moves. And here we've got a bit of eye candy after Queen C7. You can see that the Black Queen hits and covers a lot of key squares. And one or two moves can get to a lot of other key squares as well. But uh, anyway, after Queen C7 now. Now, as far as I know, Fisher never once ever played the... Um, Queen G4, you know, the white queen could come to G4 here and then take on G7. But as far as I could determine from the database, Bobby Fischer never played that line at all. He always preferred to play either knight F3 or A4 in this position, mostly knight F3. But I mean, either line, he could play either line. And um, as far as I know, Fischer never once played the, uh, the uh, queen G4 lines. And anyway, after qu queen C7, Fischer's next move, of course, is knight F3. That's just a standard line there. And if you want to see more on the continuations there, well, White does not play Queen G4. See MCO 15 beginning on page 220, and there's col that's covered in columns 37 through 42. But anyway, the actual game considered knight f3, knight c6, bishop e2, bishop to d7. I would have to say bishop to d7, in my opinion, was a slight, definitely an inaccurate move. And maybe even a very small, slight error. Um, sometimes in the winter, you can actually develop this bishop to a6. Black could consider things like a5 and b6 and bishop a6. But on bishop d7, this bishop just blocks too many pieces. It's in the way of everything. Gets in the way of the queen. Gets in the way of the rook, possibly, if the rook comes to the d file. I mean, it's just blocking. It's really not a useful developing move, in my opinion, at all. And it's something Black could, could have certainly done any time he chose to do so. Certainly didn't need to do so now. Uh, two alternatives to uh, the theory Books consider knight ge7 to be the correct move here for black. White should never take this pawn because the triple isolated pawns are useless. Uh, but another possibility here is now Korchnoi. He's one of the pioneers in the French defense. He played the French like back in the late 50s and early 60s. He played it in the, I've seen several games where he played it in the Soviet championships. And uh, he won a lot of games. And he pioneered the idea practically of an early F6 in the French. And this is a choice also of Fritz 12. So maybe this is a good time and a good opportunity for Black to look at F6. And if, if ever another game is played in this particular variant, Black can seriously look at this idea of 8 dot 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 F6 there on Black's eighth move. Corey, here's here, a little more eye candy there. It's just some highlighting. And it shows how the Black Bishop on D7 is really more in the way than anything else. Going back to the actual game there. Black played, white played bishop e2, bishop to d7, white castled kingside, knight g e7, and now white plays a very nice move. He plays a4. It's grabbing space. It's undoubtedly best, and it's a common white strategy to gain space on the queen side in many of the variations in the systems of the whole winner opening here, the, the lines that involve bishop b4 and doubling the pawns. Now, if you're not familiar with the theory of the winner, a subtle idea like a3, a4 might not occur to you, in my opinion. Of course, if you're a genius of chess, somebody like, uh, say, Kramnik or someone along those lines, then, you know, you generally tend, tend to find these kind of ideas intuitively. But uh, let's say that you're not, you know, a player like that, then I think you really have to study the games in the database. You have to look at the books and try to absorb the theory. Of course, if you're just doing simple, routine, sort of unthinking development, you play a move like bishop to d2 or bishop e3 or even bishop g5. So a4 is a move that it's kind of a refinement, and it's really a nice move. And I give it an exclam, and of course, several of the uh, the uh, the books and several of the uh, um, books on the winner, and also uh, the the uh, the informant also gives us an exclam as well. Of course, after a4, you can see there that a4 gains space and also hits the critical b5 square. That's important because, and a lot of times in, in many lines. Black's bishop will be, you know, this knight will move, and this bishop on d7 will be unable to come to that b5 square. Now, after White's last move, White's last move, of course, was a4. After White's last move, Black plays knight a5. Now, Trifunovic, or Trifunovic, I'm not exactly certain how you say his name, in the uh, volume, you know, uh, the 10th informant, game number, two, two, uh, game number 250, he gives this a dubious appellation and recommends that instead Black play the, instead of knight a5, that Black here play b6. 
that's a good move and that's an okay move. But um, I just want to hold, pull up this position here after knight a5. In my opinion, I don't think there's any difference between knight a5 and b6. In fact, uh, b6 can be seen as weakening the light squares somewhat. And r when you examine these two ideas with an engine, there's really almost no difference between the two ideas with the engine. Certainly, black has a somewhat constricted game here, but um, it's no, it's by far, in my opinion, an easy win. I mean, it's not even close to being an easy win for white. So, um, you know, there's a long way to go before you can even begin to talk about a win for white. So I think that while B6 might be more, a little more accurate, I, I'm not even 100% sure. Certainly the knight, idea of knight A5 is not bad at all. For one thing, this, this knight on A5 is mechanically holding up white from pushing this pawn every, any further. That's one thing. And the other idea is the knight's headed for C4, and that's the correct idea, at least in principle. Black's playing the French defense, the winnower system. White has an advantage in space. Black must get counterplay. He must get his pieces to active squares, and he must get his knights to outposts. And in my opinion, the sooner he does this, the better off he will be. Um, so I'm not really sure that knight a5 is a bad move. I gave it an exclam question just because, you know, the only reason I drew uh, tried to draw notice to it was because Trifunovich, you know, said it was inferior or dubious. But uh, I'm not really sure I agree with that assessment at all. But anyway, black plays knight a5. Fisher plays rook e1. This is a nice sort of subtle move. And you'll there's a very famous game where Fisher beat Larson in one of his match games. And he played this rookie one move and won a very brilliant game. But um, it's kind of a subtle move. It's kind of firing a shot across back Black's bow. In other words, the idea is that Black plays f6, opening this e-file could be a, cat, a cat, cast, catastrophe for, um, for Black. And uh, so, you know, that's something that Black probably should not consider doing. In fact, it sort of places Black in a quandary. You're wondering, well, what should he do in this position? And uh, probably the, the correct line for black here is the line given by Fritz, which would be h6, bishop a3, b6, queen d2. And here white's certainly just a little bit, in this position, white certainly got to be a little bit better. It's plus over equals. Some engines consider it plus over line. I think that's a tad over optimistic. But to, anyway, going back to this position here, white plays rookie one. And now black's next move is, in my opinion, well, I, in fact, I'm... I'll, I'm not, I'm going to qualify, unqualify that. Uh, it's not, in my opinion, Black's next move is just plain wrong. And he plays C takes D4. If you consult any book on the winner, and if you look at a lot of the games in the database, it, you'll see that most of the time when Black plays and undoubles, you know, corrects White's pawn structure, it's usually considered to be a mistake. And this position is no exception. It's And what's really troubling and a little amazing to me is that none of the masters and the players who went over this, for instance, Wade and O'Connell and their book on Bobby Fischer and Trifunovich and his you know, comments on this game and the informant, not, and many, many others. There were several magazine articles that carried annotations of this game. And none of those could I find an example of someone giving this move a question mark. But yet it's a standard error. It's, a, it's usually considered a beginner kind of error there. Now there's a reason that Schweber does this. Schweber did this because he's trying to place his knight on the strong C4 square, and he wants his knight on basically, uh, you know, half. Usually, you're taught, you know, when you're first starting out, that the best kind of outpost for a knight is knights on a half open file, and that's what this is now after the exchange of C takes D4. So there was a logical and good reason for Schwever to do this exchange, but it doesn't change the fact that it's wrong. And here's the other real kicker: is that almost all the engines you fire up any of the chess engines, Fritz, uh, Houdini, Ribka. Uh, Shredder, uh, Deep Junior, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, I used uh, Fritz 12 on this uh, game quite a bit. I used Houdini 1.5. Those were my two main engines. I also used Shredder. It's an older version. It's like two versions old or one version old. And also the latest version of Deep Junior and a couple other engines. In fact, I probably used a grand total of around 20 engines, but only about a handful of engines on a regular basis. But all of the engines, if you put them in this position and play this move, C takes D4, the little warning light comes on and the evaluations just take a tremendous nosedive. So there's no doubt in my mind that this was an incorrect move. And what's really a little shocking is that none of the many masters who commented on this game pointed that fact out. Even Trifunovich, who I consider to be one of the best annotators of this game, seemed to do the best and most objective job, did not question this move in the least, and he said nothing at all about this move in his annotations of this historic encounter in his annotations in the um, informant, which again, which was volume number 10. 
But anyway, there's no doubt that C takes D4 is a mistake. It's an error. And anyway, white plays C takes D4. Of course, he recaptures with a pawn. White's quite happy to un uh, undouble his pawns. I know I used to play the white side of the winner myself. Still do. I, had, I don't play it as much as I did many years ago. And uh, I you remember quite, uh, occasionally I would have an opponent that would be foolish enough to undouble my pawns. And of course, that always um, placed a big smile on my face. I was always quite happy when my opponent did that. Black goes ahead and plays knight c4. Of course, that's a logical move. He meant to place his knight on the on the outpost square, so he needs to do that. And now we have bishop to d3. Now, Trifunovich gives this move an exclam here. And since there are several playable alternatives, I'm going to go ahead and second that, that exclam. I'm going to back him up here. Um, this is a good place for a diagram. We're going to just sit here and leave this position up for a little while. Um, the main point, now too, we see the main point, in my opinion, of why the early undoubling of the pawn, this or black's early C takes D4, was incorrect. This bishop, white squared bishop, goes to D3 and it just stays there. And black is almost unable to kick it off. And that changes the whole game in a very major way, in my opinion. So that's basically what we can see. Of course, white could have played other moves like common moves like C3, which is a, a very routine move. And of course, after bishop D3, now you can readily see how much more space and how many more open lines the white pieces have compared to the black pieces. And that's a good graphical way of looking at the position. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and back up now. And here black plays h6. Now, many of my lower, I've showed this to quite a few students over the years, especially some students. I recently had a group of kids just about two months ago that I was already working on this game. And they came over from Mobile to, uh, to work with me for a half day at the Books a Million. And anyway, one of them asked me, well, Mr. Goldsley, why didn't Black go ahead and castle here? And of course, when he asked that question, I realized that, that uh, you know, why well, I had already uh, begun to analyze this, but uh, I decided I had to include a complete analysis of that option at this point because the average player is going to ask that question. And here, if Black had castle, let's just take a look at that because that's just an amazing thing here. And, uh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and, and turn off the... Uh, notation for a second. All I want you looking is just the chessboard. Now let's just say for a minute and pretend you didn't see the, the move, what happened. Ask yourself, and if you want to, I'm going to, I'm going to go silent here in just a second. Um, after I finish talking, I want you to maybe pause the video for a few minutes and think about what the best move is for white. You can go ahead and pause the video now. Okay, if you did like I asked and paused the video, hopefully you, you paused the video and you studied this position for as long as you wanted to. And the main idea is ask yourself, what is the correct idea for white? I mean, you know, how does white proceed from this position? And if you understand these positions at all or have ever played chess for any length of time, you would know that this was a classic um, time for white to play something called I'm sorry, I have to open up that file just so we can see the notation again, called the Greek sacrifice or the Greek gift. And that's a sack on H7. And that's, of course, what would have happened had, of course, Schweber and Fisher were good enough to avoid that completely. They're not going to fall for that. For that, that would have been something pretty routine and simple. But let's just quickly look at the analysis of this uh, line. And again, and this is analyzed on my uh, web page. Uh, there's a link for it. But I have a web page now on the Greek gift where I just analyze this alone. And since this was such an, a potent example of the Greek gift, I decided to analyze it in its entirety on that page. But anyway, bishop takes h7, king takes a7, knight g5 check. The king's got to go g6. If the king goes back, it's just a fairly simple routine, routine win. If the ki black king goes back, white simply goes queen h5 and it's all over. So anyway, black king goes to g6. This is forced. And now rook a3. Uh, that's a computer move. The normal move there is probably the move you be, were expecting was a move like queen g4, and that would probably win for white because the black king is pretty much in a box. But this this move, rook a3, this is a very nice move because if left alone, white will simply play rook g3, and then that black king will be completely toast. So black can't allow that, and that's why here he plays f6. And white plays e takes f, f6. And now black goes ahead and grabs the knight, not because he's being materialistic, but simply because there's not very many good alternatives. And now white has a very nice move. Really, you could give this move a double x clam, but it's certainly unexpected because you'd be expect, you know, white after a capture, the normal expected move is, is to recapture the capturing piece. And of course, that's just normal, the tempo, the normal rhythm of chess. But here white plays a very nice move. He goes queen g4, putting the black king in dire danger. And all these moves are computer generated. I, I'm not going to pull your leg and tell you I could have found you know, all of these moves, I might not have been able to fight hardly any of these moves unless I had an engine. I mean, these 
these moves are very deep. I could have found the sack. I could have found the bishop sack up to this point. I mean, check here. I could have found all this. And then if I were analyzing this on my own, I probably would have spent all my energy looking at a move like queen g4 because that's the normal type of move or even queen d3 check there. But uh, this this bishop, this rook rather, not bishop, rook a3 move in my opinion is just a computer move. It's not the kind of move that a human would normally look at. Simply they tend to discount it because it looks like a blunder because of knight takes rook and it's not clear what white's follow-up is. But anyway, f6, e takes f6, knight takes a3. These are all, moves are all forced according, and I checked this analysis line with about five different engines, Crafty, uh, Fritz 12, Houdini, uh, 1.5, Ribka, and uh, also, um, I forget what the other engine was. Oh, Deep Junior. So, uh, you know, I mean, this is, I, I will say this line is as close to being as airtight as they come. And also, too, I did many DPAs. DPAs are deep position analysis where you allow the engine to run overnight. And I did that with more than one engine. I had several months that I was working on this and actively working on this analysis. But anyway, queen g4, that's another nice move. You could almost give that move a double x clam. e5, knight e6, check, discover check. King, king takes f6, there isn't much choice there. The other lines lead to, to mate or an easy win. Um, for example, king h7, just queen takes mate. You know, or king f7, check, check, check. Goes over there, check, and knight e3, queen takes knight, and that's a mate. So anyway, those are all the uh, the alternatives there. So king takes f6 was completely forced. And now you get rook takes e5, and according to the computer, the only move here that doesn't end in mate, the only line that doesn't end in mate, is queen takes e5. That's not giveaway, that's just forced, otherwise black will get mated. E takes, d takes e5 check, king f7, knight g5 check, king there, e6. And now this is again another forced move. Black has to, to take the pawn. Knight takes. Knight takes c2. You know nothing's going to save black there. So I guess the logic here is just to eat as many pieces as you can. Knight c7 check. King d8. Knight takes a8. Now here black has avoided the checkmate. He has not gotten checkmate. Checkmated. So it's a victory in black in the sense that earlier I thought for sure if I had to look at the position I would say it was absolutely certain that black would get checkmated. So the computer was able to avoid. The checkmate, however, it's a very pyrrhic victory because, uh, you know, it's just simply a one game for white on the material scale. I mean, there's not too many players that would want to play this position from the black side against anyone. So this, you know, the, and I'm sure the average human player would probably resign here. But anyway, let's go ahead and back up. The reason for this H6 line, we see now we see the, the reason for this H6 line, why Schweber didn't castle is because he'd have run into the bulldozer. He'd have been slammed by that. That knockout move there, bishop takes h7 check. So black plays h6. White plays knight d2. And in my opinion, that was a good move. An x clam. White had a lot of good alternatives there. And there were so many good moves, I won't even cover them all. But, uh, you know, he had all kinds of good good plans and alternatives. But knight d2 is very good. And it's kind of like a strategical idea. I guess the best way to express it would be that after knight c, you know, this knight sitting on c4 in this position, that black's very best piece is this knight on c4, and so it makes sense that white would want to go ahead and try to remove that or ex liquidate that piece or exchange it off. And white had several other moves there, but I'm certain knight d2 is the best simply because, you know, the, the engines, it's logical and all the engines show it to be the best move for white. Anyway, here, black exchange off. Now, in my opinion, that was almost a mistake. I think what black wanted to do is he wanted white to take here, retake the pawn, and that would have given him an open diagonal for his, his queen's bishop. Why he didn't do that, I don't know. I mean, if I'd have been black here, I might have just simply played maybe g6, knight f5, or castle queenside, and then try to run your king over off to the b, maybe even to the corner would be the safest place, and initiate a pawn storm on the king side on white's king. Do something that's active. Because if we've learned one thing in the last 10 or 20 years, most modern masters won't even consider a line that's extremely passive and has very little counterplay because all the top players that say we'll say the big boys of chess the 2700s they all seem to know or understand instinctively that any line that's just totally passive is generally going to lose and, and usually lose badly so anyway knight d2 now black went ahead and took there again i think he should have allowed white to, you know to you know black should have allowed white to capture on c4 and that would have opened up the diagonal for his lsb and also given his his, his knight a square on d5 but for whatever reason, there black took and white retook with the bishop. 
And now we'll just stop and look at this position for a second. And you can see that, you know, White's got a very clear advantage. He's got two wonderful bishops. He no longer has any worries about pawn structure because Black was nice enough to undouble his pawns. And, you know, it's just it's just a really nice position for White. Some of the engines are already showing an almost overwhelming advantage for White at this point. And now the only question for Black, of course, is how do you proceed from here? What Where do you go from here? Well, Black's next move is just totally wrong. I mean, it looks like it's logical, but, you know, it's it's got to be bad. He plays knight c6. And we know that, you know, that that was a mistake, if for no other reason, because all the engines, you know, the light comes on and the evaluations take a really large nosedive. You just can't allow that kind of move. Um, also, too, the other problem, problem with knight c6 is after this inaccurate move, black will never be able to castle kingside, and the course of the game will prove that. Black should have played, you know, castles when the best move that uh, Fritz can come up with is queen f3. Now, it's showing a huge plus there for white. I mean, it's like plus over a line or even plus minus by some engines. However, you know, the bottom line is black has not yet lost any material, and, um, and there's all kind of plans. I mean, if I were white, one very simple plan for white is simply play c3, queen g3, or actually c3, g4, queen c3, a uh, queen g3 rather, f4, double my rooks on the f file, rook f1, double the rooks on f file, and then play f5, and it's going to be a bombs away on the on the the black king, and I don't see black surviving that because white will literally have all of his pieces trained on the king side, and he has an advantage in space and pawn structure as well. And that's kind of an oversimplification, but you should get the general idea. But the point being is that at least in this line, black has a chance. There's a possibility of white going wrong. Maybe not Bobby Fischer. Bobby Fischer didn't go wrong. Usually when he had the advantage, he was, you know, very deadly. But, you know, at least, you know, black's, you know, in the game, and it's certainly an improvement over the actual game. There's no doubt after this knight c6 move that black's just going to get a very bad game. Maybe in Schweber's defense, he was expecting some routine move like c3 here and thought that would have, he would have been okay. But Fisher, of course, doesn't play routinely or very rarely. You know, he played queen g4 here. And now it's a very simple idea. If black castles kingside in this position, simply bishop takes pawn h6, threatening a mate, black gets mashed. If you play g6, bishop takes g6, and black's probably going to get mated very, very quickly there. So, you know, it, it, the point being is knight c6, because knight c6, black can no longer castle uh, queenside. And after queen g4, you can see some of the ideas that are at work here. White's got rook luffs up and over. The queen is hitting so many key squares. The g7 pawn is hanging. The two bishops have just two wicked diagonals there on, on the black king. So at, at this point, black's not going to be able to castle kingside. Now Houdini here wants to white to uh, wants black to castle queenside and just play giveaway with his pawns. He literally gives away two or three pawns in short order, and in my opinion, that's just that's just losing. You're going to do that against a, a Bobby Fisher. You might as well just resign. So Fisher, I mean rather Schweber here plays the only move that he could against Fisher, and that was G6. Consider that to be forced or box. Uh, obviously, if black starts giving away pawns, then he might as well throw in the towel. Now, here we have a big change in the position. Again, after that bad knight c6 move, queen g4, now this g6. Fritz and all the other engines are showing a huge advantage uh, for white in this position. Fritz is showing an eval of plus minus or plus uh, 1.99, uh, and that's after like letting it run overnight. However, that's a tad over optimistic in my opinion. Uh, now, the best move according to about a dozen different engines, and some of them, again, doing DPAs, that's a deep position analysis allowing the engine to run overnight with an unlimited amount of time or you know asking it to do like a 10 ply search in all directions just about all the engines come up with reb1 and that certainly makes a lot of sense think about it logically black if he's going to make progress in the position he's going to have to castle queen side therefore after reb1 white will have basically he can bring the queen back he can get all of his pieces pointed dead at the black king and basically get after the black king in very short order and so that seems like to me to be extremely logical. And again, you know, the engine seemed to, to, to do that. Now, several of the annotators have given Fisher's next move an exclam. Um, uh, Wade, if you want to see an example of that, just go to the Wade and O'Connell book on Bobby Fisher. And also to the BCM uh, uh, magazine series, that, that author also gave this move an exclam. But in my opinion, it wasn't worthy of an exclam. In fact, I don't, it might even be inaccurate. But uh, so anyway, I just uh, gave it an exclam question, just sort of draw attention to that fact that it's a key move and leave it at that. Now, Black's next move is certainly probably going to be a mistake and Black castles here. And 
this one's kind of difficult to explain, but uh, basically it's it's an opportunity type thing more than anything else. The the engines discover a very neat little move for Black, and the neat little move is this Queen B6, and that would have basically threatening Queen B2 and maybe start gobbling pawns, and also the D4 square is double hit, and that might force White to play C3 unless he wants to play a Gambit, which in my opinion he cannot do. So uh, having said all that, I think that uh, or White's got to play Bishop C3, and maybe that's not the the best post for his his bishop but anyway queen b6 was definitely an improvement over the uh, the uh, actual game again fritz 12 deep junior and houdini 1.5 all picked that move as the best move for black schweiber missed that he played the rather routine castling queen side and now you know fisher's going to continue to get get a uh, uh, a good game now in this position here let's take a note of this position here um Many, again, many of the authors, BCM, uh, there's a book collection on Fisher's games. I won't, I don't even remember the author off the top of my head. I think he gives this move a double X clam, but uh, Wade and O'Connell, they give this move an X clam. Um, and uh, what is, it's, it's just, it, unless black plays a move like F5, rook G3 really doesn't make any, a lot of sense. In fact, the move that makes a lot of sense would be just rook F3 to hit the, the F pawn. But anyway, um, what Fisher played rook g3. Again, you can see what I wrote down there. Fritz 12, instead of rook g3, preferred a4, a5, while Houdini likes rook b1. And that's after many hours of analysis. And of course, uh, now here, here's another very strange move, and it's strange not in the terms of the, what's transpiring on the chessboard, but what the annotators said about these moves. And black plays king b8. Normally, that's a very good move. In other words, white might be thinking about playing c4 and opening the c file, Needless to say, black doesn't want his king and queen on an open file. That's just common sense. However, Trifunovich, in his annotations in the informant, gives that king move a question mark. And to me, that's just not even... And he doesn't even bother to tell us what black should have played instead of king b8. So uh, I was going to grade an inferior move, but I eventually decided it's it's rather a logical move. And uh, But however, there's another nice move here. And the really nice move, the computery move, the ones the engines find, is to play well actually one of the engines wants to play h5 to me that's just weakening the dark squares even worse than they already are i don't like that at all the move i like to play would be actually um skip that the move i would want to play here if i were black was bg5 and uh, the idea being again you know trying to take away that square and just maybe the basic idea being after g5 maybe if i get enough time i can play rook g8 and play h5, hitting the queen, gain of time, h4, hitting the rook, gain of time, and getting a pawn storm, and maybe maybe I'll have a chance, but simply because, you know, I've got very active pieces, and I'm doing what you're supposed to doing, what you're supposed to be doing in opposite side castling situations, which is, when you castle it on opposite sides, generally, the, the, the game becomes an all-out race to get go get the other guy's king, and the normal motif or the normal mode of operation, the way you go get the other guy's king, is you initiate a pawn storm. So that's why I like the g5 idea. But anyway, king b8 is what uh, uh, Schweber actually played. Again, the big mystery, Chafunovich gives us a question mark. Doesn't even bother to tell us what uh, Schweber should have played instead of king b8, which leaves me scratching my head and going, hmm, not really sure what he was what he was trying to communicate there. Um uh, he's assuming psychic communication or something. I'm certainly not on the same wavelength as Grandmaster Trifunovic. I wish he would have told me what he thought was best. But anyway, uh, it was a rather logical mo move. Now, Fisher's next move, he plays Rook F3. Kind of logical because you're hitting, you know, the, the backward pawn over there on on uh, F7. But, um, and BCM, I think the, the author there gives it an X clam. Trifunovic gives it an X clam and in uh, informant number 10 and uh, actually i thought the rook should have stayed on g3 the idea being to discourage f5 because then the rook can slam on on g6 and if that happened the game's over um what i might have tried if i was white was lead and also too the other idea of rook f3 is the queen and it's a lot of lines the queen's gonna have to redeploy it's gonna have to come back to the queen side to try to get after the black king and this rook on f3 is kind of blocking that redeploy idea so uh, if I had been white, maybe an idea rather than rook f3 going back one move might have just simply been played queen c3 and then start redeploying. In other words, bring this piece back, but leave the rook on g3 to discourage black from playing f5 and starting his uh, pawn storm. And then I can get my all all my pieces and this rook can cut across 
the fourth rank easy, easy enough, or the third rank rather easy enough, and it can get back into the game pretty easily. But anyway, there's some several ideas there for White. Uh, you know, Fisher played Rook F3. Again, Trifunovich gives that an exclam in the informant. Um, I believe that was praised in the BCM magazine series at all. Well, the move I like there is A5, 19 A5. Fritz 12 doing a DPA found that move. And to me, that move just makes a lot of sense. All of White's options are kept open. The third rank isn't covered by a pawn. Uh, the pieces can get out of the way. Maybe the bishop, White light square bishop can go to B5 or F1. This rook can go here. Maybe we can even double our rooks on the uh, the, the the B file. And the queen can redeploy. I mean, the whole uh, it just makes a lot of sense there. So rook F3, well, eh, I, you could have said it was an error. I don't know if I would have necessarily given an error, but I certainly don't think uh, such a simple move deserved an exclam. You know, just simply putting a rook on a on a you know attacking a loose pawn. I mean, you know, if we're going to give exclams to those kind of moves, you know, there there had to be something deeper at work there. But I'm not sure. You know, if if I buy into all the praise of this move is what I'm saying. Now I, I'll just let you know here. Let's just back up here for a second. White just played rook f3, and, and the notation is off because I want it off. Just leave it like that for a second. And uh, here, it, you know, try to guess uh, basically what black should should play here. And I'm going to stop speaking in a minute, and what I'd like you to do is, if you want to, you don't have to, but if you want to, go ahead and pause the video and just try to analyze for a few minutes and decide what you think, honestly, black should play here. So go ahead and pause the video now. Okay, if you did like I asked, you went ahead and paused the video. And the main idea was being, you know, basically, what does black play in this position? And uh, when I was first playing over this game, what black actually winds up playing was he plays the move f5 here, okay? When I was first playing over this this uh, game without a computer assistance and not looking any books, and I was looking at just the unannotated game in the database, I considered f5 to be the losing move. wasn't the only one, by the way. Several other masters, including Trefunovich, also gave it an ex uh, question mark. And, and maybe targeted as the losing move. However, this is what I, some insights I gained into this game. Okay, um, F5 is the first choice of several engines. Fritz 12, just one of them. Uh, the bottom line is you have to kind of look at this position logically. And the logic of this position demands that black do something. Uh, Trifunovich, instead of F5, he recommends a very constipated rather backward uh, move of bishop h which also interferes with the lateral movement of both of these rooks that disconnects the rooks and black is left with a position with zero counterplay and i just can't believe that that's you know any kind of good move at all in fact it looks like a worse move than f5 and the fact that the engines pick f5 basically the way you could interpret it the way i would say it i think the best way of stating this black's position is he's got to find counterplay he's got to find some kind of way of getting his pieces in the game and F5 is the best way of doing that. Uh, you could describe it as a computer-supported gamble, or since this game was played long before computers ever became a really factor in chess, you could describe it as a desperate bid for freedom by Schweiber. But uh, anyway, I, like I already said, you can see there in the notes, uh, Trifunovich in the informant said that, that that move was a question mark. Okay, White goes ahead and opens the position. He has two bishops, so he wants to open up the position as much as possible. Of course, white plays, you know, that e5, black plays rather e5 here. That seems like a very natural move. In fact, it seems like you're going to play e4 and, and fork two pieces and wind up winning material, which was another reason why maybe this rook should have never went to f3 in the first place. But um, anyway, to make a long story short here, black plays e5. I have pinpointed that. I think that might have been the losing move. Uh, there's a much, much better move, and you can find it with any of the engines. So you, all you have to do is look is g5. The idea is to keep that stupid uh, bishop on d2, the DSB, off the dark squares. Obviously, black's king and queen are lined up on a diagonal, so black very much needs that bishop not to ever arrive on that, that square. And then maybe play e5 and then and go from there. And, uh, you know, that would have some threats. And in some of these lines that I analyzed, black actually wound up winning this pawn back by force. And if black wins his pawn back by force, he's no longer material down and maybe has a shot at, you know, having a halfway decent game. Anyway, long story short, this e5 is a very, very bad move. I could literally have given that two question marks if I wanted to, and that's based on, you know, basically analysis and, you know, the engines also pinpoint that as a very bad move for black. And also, too, logically, the last thing black needs to do is eventually open up this diagonal here because that's the cause of all of his problems. I mean, his king or queen 
are you know sitting on on bad squares. If he were going to do that, what he should have done is, if he really wanted to make this part of his plans, then maybe it should should have first got his king in the corner, then played e5, f5 and e5, and that might have been a better idea, because now at least as queen, there would have never been this tactic that won the game for Fisher. But anyway, in this exact position, black plays e5. It was a really, really bad idea for black, but and this is the funny thing. Again, no one, as far as I can tell, has really questioned that that this particular move. Now, Fisher's next move, in my opinion, is really a, a very fine move. And I really think that Fisher was very aware of what was going on position. Can't prove it for an absolute fact. But uh, it's very possible that Fisher was simply playing with his uh, slightly weaker opponent, or much weaker opponent, really, and sort of tempting him in Laskirian style to uh, to make a mistake. And, uh, you know, and once he makes a mistake, Fisher comes down on him, you know, like a 10 tons of bricks. And that's exactly what happens now. Fisher plays a very nice move. He plays queen g3. In my opinion, that's the move that basically wins the game. And in fact, it looks like a mistake. The natural move there, after, instead of queen to g3, was to snatch this pawn on g6. If I were playing blitz, that would be the move I would probably make. But Fisher plays queen g3. And this is the move where Fisher, I think, had everything calculated out to a win and began seeing all the traps and all the cute little tactical finesses that occur in this game. And it was a tough move to find. And I think you have to be a magical player to really see all of what happens and transpires afterward, especially have all of these variations, um, um, you know, mapped out. And now some authors have given Queen G3 an X clam, but as far as I know, no one has given this move a double X clam. And in my opinion, that's the move that you really have to praise. And it's really the, the uh, it, it forms the cornerstone of uh, Fisher's whole conception here. Well, you Queen G3. Black plays knight takes d4. Needless to say, e5 is just a, e4 rather e5 e4 forking two pieces is a gross blunder because white simply responds bishop f4 you know pinning black's queen to his king and the game is over. So anyway, e, knight takes d4, rook e3. Now Fisher has a very you know base threat, a very powerful threat. Rook takes pawn, queen takes bishop f4, pinning the queen to the king. Game over. And Wade and Connell both give this move an exclam. You could even give it a double X clam almost, but I mean, but it's certainly an X clam move. And also, too, there was a trap there. And there, uh, that's another thing is I found this trap. No one, as far as I know, pointed out this trap was the idea of rook f4, hoping that you'll just take with a pawn, and then he takes back with the bishop with a one game. But the problem is black plays g5. And now it's not so easy anymore. Now the white basically has to sack an exchange, and black's, you know, white's advantage falls down to almost zero. And that's a trap I think Fisher, I'm pretty certain that he, he looked at that over the board. If not, rook f4 would have been a very good idea. But instead, he played rook e3. And I think he must have seen that trap and bypassed it. So therefore, rook e3 is worthy of an exclam, if for no other reason because of that. Anyway, move on with the game e4. And now we get the rook takes e4. You know, another exclam move. You know, and of course, he's got to, now he's threatening bishop f4, painting the queen to the king. So Schweber's got to think, well, I'll go ahead and swap the queens off. Let's get the queens off the board, and uh, I'll win. You know, I'll be able to. I'll be okay. He takes the queen, and now we get Fisher's. We see the real brilliance of a Bobby Fisher, and also the fact that he's got everything playing ahead. He plays this little in-between move, uh, Swishensvut. It's a in-between move. He plays rook takes d4, exploiting the fact that as the bishop comes back, the bishop just goes to f4, takes the queen, and he regains all his material, and he has just a one game because you know he's at least one pawn up one pawn ahead so anyway this was fisher's witty little trap here and of course the movies the moves are quite easily you know discovered by the machines but that just goes without saying and of course once more wade and o'connell and you know give this an exclam trifunovich even gives rook takes d4 a double exclam there to me rook takes d4 is not the double exclam move the move that really needs to be praised is the one that set all this up in advance and that's to that for that effect you have to go back i think to that queen g3 move Okay, and moving on here with the game, black plays queen g4. All the engines agree that black has to retreat his bishop, allow white to do this. Eventually what happens is white is going to have a pawn up ending and probably will win, but it was the toughest line according to all the engines. What Schweber does here now is he tries to win the exchange, but this was just dumb in, in, in a lot of different ways. Because after queen g4 here, the big problem here is that after queen g4, rook takes queen, bishop takes queen, bishop takes g6. Fisher's now got a bishop and two pawns for a rook. And it's just, he's got material, he's got position, he's got a pass pawn. 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's basically all over if you can evaluate positions and you don't even need an engine now at this point to do that. It's pretty easy to see that White has won game. Here, Black plays RHG8. Maybe you should have put the Rook on F8, but he put the Rook on G8. And now White just, you know, he he plays to, to win the exchange back. The Rook goes back. The Bishop goes here. RDE8. Now Fisher plays F7. Now all the engines seem to indicate that the best move for White is Bishop to B4, and I have to agree because the base idea is that you know F7 could win a whole Rook if this Rook decides to leave the file, go up the board. So anyway, but uh, he Fisher plays F7, Rook there, Queen takes, and now Fisher's idea is pretty simple and it's plainly seen. These two Rooks are lined up on a dark square, so Fisher has the very simple tactic of Bishop B4, regaining the exchange, staying a pawn ahead. And then RF7, RFF7, Bishop takes E7, Rook takes E7, F3, Bishop D7. And now take a note of this position. So an end game's been reached. Fisher is one of the finest end games and best chess, test chess technicians of all time that has ever lived. And so we can be reasonably assured that Fisher's going to win the game from here. Black plays, now here White plays A5. That's not necessarily an easy move to play. In fact, Fritz, when it first fired up, if you just fired up brand new on this position with nothing stored in its memory or its hash tables, clear the hash tables, it doesn't find this move right away. It initially looks at moves like King F2 and a couple others there. So this is a very fine move. The main idea of this being to restrain the major, Black's ma, queenside majority, also maybe restrain this Black King from getting out and getting too active. King F, King C7. Of course, the Kings are a fighting piece in the end game. Both kings get activated. King f2, rook f7, rook king e3, king d6, g3, king c5, f4. White's getting his majority rolling. That's another basic principle of the end game. Bishop g4, rook b1, rook e7 check, king d2, b6, a takes b6, a takes b6. Now here are the best move according to all the computers. I did a DPA here with Houdini 1.5. And F5 is by far the best best line. Just to quickly show you that line, F5 double X clam, and we'll just run through the moves here. They have their own logic. It's on my webpage, so you'll be able to find that. And now White plays rookie five. He's going to win yet another pawn. And then he just marches his king back over to F4, pushes this pawn, and runs two connectors up the board. It's a very easy win, and it makes Black's resistance almost zero or very, very small. And... Uh, that was much better than the game. H3, though, is like the Capablanca type continuation. If Black's dumb enough to take, Rook H1 and Rook takes Pawn. Same idea, you have two connectors running up the board. But, of course, Swever doesn't take. Bishop D7, G4, D4, F5, Rook E3, F6. Now, if he takes Pawns, we just play Rook F1, and, and Black's going to be, you know, he's going to be losing a piece. May even have to give up his Rook to stop the pass Pawn. Rook F3, Rook F1, Rook takes, Bishop takes, Bishop E6. Now I think what happened is, see, to understand what happens, you have to have understand how they used to play chess. They don't play chess this way as much anymore. Back in the good old days of chess, the first session was usually five hours, and then you went to an adjournment, and usually the first the time control was 40 moves in two and a half hours, or 45 moves in two and a half hours, or even sometimes 45 moves in three hours. But anyway, in the old days of chess, you know, you would have often have a time scrabble, and when both players were sure they had passed the time control, then they would stop, take a breath, take look around. And I think that's what happened to Schweber is realized he made the time control, stopped, took a breath, looked around, said, gee, I'm falling down. Or, worse yet, Fisher's got an easy win. He can just shove those passers. So he took a look around and decided to resign. But anyway, that's the pretty much the whole game. I do have a web page on this game. Thank you for watching my video. If you enjoyed my video and would like to support it, go to the PayPal website. My uh, account can be accessed or you can make a donation to my websites just by using my email, which is lifemasteraj at yahoo.com. But even if you don't, you know, you don't have, don't have to do that. That's just if you really want to. Uh, if let's say you enjoyed the thing enjoyed the video and enjoyed the webpage, just want to say thanks. Again, my email is lifemasteraj at yahoo.com. And the other thing I wanted to say is, uh, you know, if you see an improvement, you think I can genuinely make an improvement and or you'd like to make a suggestion or a lot of people have a want to say, hey, AJ, this is a great game of chess. Why haven't you looked at this game? Mainly because life isn't long enough. There's just too many great games out there. But if you want to just write me and just say, say hello or uh, chat about chess or have some suggestion to make, again, my email is lifemasteraj at yahoo.com. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoy the webpage and have a great day.